Welcome to The Brag Effect, where we share easy to understand customer service tips from business owners and leaders that will help you get your customers bragging about you in all the right ways. Hi, I'm Mike Wells, and together with my co-host, Michelle Adams. Hey, Michelle. Hi, Mike. A big thanks for joining us. So we're here today with Peter Fielding from the Burley Brewery Company. Welcome, Peter. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's fantastic <laughs> to be here. So we, I've heard a lot about the Burley Brewery Company for a while, and they're doing a lot of great things down here at the Tap House Brewery in Burley. And we're just here to find out a lot about, uh, as much as we can, about what makes them great, because they clearly are doing a lot of things awesome. So, Peter, we're wondering, the vision for this came from somewhere, uh, and it was quite a while ago, and we're just wondering how, what was some of the starting points for how you, how you started this vision? Because it's coming to being now, it's, it's crazy. It has, now. and it's, yeah, it's kind of cool to see something that you imagined in your head kind of rise up and, and yeah it's cool to be able to actually walk into it but so that start? um it was kind of a coming together of two people and two passions really um i always grew up knowing that i wanted to create something and that that's kind of what it felt like to put it to any other words other than i wanted to create something that didn't exist and you know as i uh, got older i guess that be- became clarified as i wanted to create a business um i didn't know what product service whatever i was more passionate about um, creating the business, I knew what it would feel like. That was kind mm-hmm. of what yeah. I could, and I can't <laughs> touch on so I want to say, because I, I just remember, I, I remember feel what it would feel like, like yeah. as opposed to seeing my head. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Brandon, who became my husband, uh, was growing up on the other side of the earth in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, and he was equally passionate about becoming a brewer and, and about brewing and, and the science and the creative process and um, of creating flavors and, and the history of brewing, all those things, it was just his world, I don't know where it started. I do know that he was very lucky to have a dad who was a bit before his time in that space and yeah. he used to seek out beers um, before craft brewing was really a thing. He used to seek out beers from different places. So Brennan does have memories as a youngster of his dad, you know, showing his friends different labels and whatever else. Yeah. So whether it started there, I don't know. But when we, I was in America studying and when we met um, and what were you saying? You're saying corporate law? I, I, I did law here, knowing yeah. that I, I probably wasn't going to practice law forever, but I just felt like that was, I'd probably get some good skills that would help me when I figured out what I was going to create. Yeah. So I did practice for a while. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. I'm just I thinking, stepped away because I wanted to do this other thing. I'm just thinking that the corporate law and studying the practice of that maybe drove you to a brewery. But, um, so yeah, I was studying over there, met Brennan, and, uh, you know, it, it kind of just... Snowballed. Yeah, it did, we, we didn't kind of ever sit down and go, you know, maybe we should start a brewery together. It just, it was clear. Yeah. Once we, we found a laugh, that made business negotiations much easier. Yeah. But, but once we kind of got through all that, it just, we just knew what something we wanted to do together. And I, you know, have distinct memories of, of when we weren't working together. Um, and, and kind of both of us getting home from work exhausted and whatever else and there's just this sense that he was going off and he was working in a brewery and, and you know being passionate and amazing all day and I was going off and being busy doing my thing we'd get home and we'd both do that we didn't get to do that amazing stuff yeah. together we wanted to bring it together yeah which is an incredible thing working with your partner yes it's totally really, you know help keep you together absolutely it's um it's been an amazing journey Mm. To, to share. Well, we were bringing up kid, kids. There's a whole other journey. <laughs> the two yeah, years yeah. Ago. We have two. Yeah, three. <laughs> yeah, well, <Let's> go, <laughs> four. Read it, no. <laughs> <Four months>. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the amazing things you're doing here. You've got an outdoor cinema. You've got the brewery, obviously, which you just gave us a tour for, which is, is incredible. Um, and you've got the, the venue, the tap house, which is going great, guys. So people obviously lining up to get into that. Uh, you're also featured in, uh, you're, you're going to a lot of festivals. I saw the, the Gold Coast, it's the Broad Beach Festival. Yeah, the Craft Festival it, on the yeah, weekend. So the Delta yeah. Rigs there, which is a really cool event. <laughs> yeah, craft beer festivals are turning into quite the thing. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and this month actually, we're calling it Festival Month. I think we're at a festival every single weekend. Which yeah. Is, yeah, pretty exciting. Great to have a team now to help us do that. It used to be. We did Monday to Friday, and we did the beer festivals on the weekend. Mm. And, you know, and on that, we've, we've met going. some of your team here this morning. We've met uh, Rosalind on, on entry, and we've met Todd, who is the uh, logistics manager, yep. I think. And clearly, the buzz around the office here. We're upstairs here from the brewery, and you've, you've got uh, all the admin staff and the, the, the financial people. And uh, there's a great vibe, and they're clearly taking ownership. But they're also, you can, I can feel the difference. So I'm really curious on how you've 
help to create that. We mentioned the image before that you're just doing a lot of little things, probably that, that you're doing as part of your role that you've taken on. Can you share with what some of those little things are that are helping to, to really create that team? Yeah, sure. Look, I, I do think it is a lot of little things, I think. And, and in the early days, you know, like I said, I knew how it was going to feel. And that process of um, bringing that feeling to life actually was hard. It was harder than I thought. Um, I, I don't know if I kind of thought, oh, you just, um, oh, I don't know, celebrate people's birthdays and do this handful of things and everyone should love coming to work. Is it that easy? Uh, no, it turns out it's not. <laughs> uh, but I think going back to um, just really being authentically me because that was what was driving it anyway and rather than trying right. to do things I felt like I should be doing. So what's the difference just, between celebrating and bringing the cake out for the person and, and when you say authentically you, is it an energy shift where you just you really did just go, you know what, I do want to give a cake, or was it other things? I think it was. I think it was kind of stepping back and going, what what's what's important uh, to me, and and therefore what's probably important to other families and other right. people in our business, and how can we, we can't we can't do it. Everyone would probably love to work two days a week and be able to go home two o'clock, <laughs> and you know, if I could deliver it, I'd love to. Yeah. But well, no, we can't. But if trying to find ways, so for example, you know, people talk about. Um, uh, flexible work environment arrangements. Yeah, yeah that's what does now. It's very hard when you're making beer and you need to brush at six a.m. Yeah. Um, you can't sit at home in the kitchen in your pajamas, and you know there are some roles that you can you can't for brewing. Yeah. So because when the beer's ready, it's like you saying the beer's telling you it's ready. And you're going to it's stop when it's ready. Yeah. You're to do and the brewing shifts we run a shift. Well, pretty much we're in operation Monday to Friday from six a.m. to about seven seven thirty p.m. Yeah. Uh, and so in that context, um, you know, people can't kind of call us, I'm going to be in a 10, mm. but brewing has to start at 6. And yet I wanted to try and at least be able to give people that little bit of flexibility. And so I was kind of thinking about ways to try and do that in a very inflexible environment. So for example, with our um, team, we worked really hard and it couldn't be done in five minutes, but we worked really hard to cross train. Mm -hmm. So that um, if people wanted to swap a shift yeah. or, and so therefore have some ownership around some flexibility, that they could do that because there was someone else who could step in and, and So and as long as the function is covered, you were happy with Absolutely. With um, we run an overlap uh, shift 6am to 2pm and then 11 to 7 basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then as we've grown, we've, we've been able to kind of fill in spots, not because there was a gap, but to be able to create some overlaps and some redundancy. So if someone's on holidays or if someone does yeah. need to, you know, change a shift around or something, uh, they can they can do it. So it's not, oh, I'll just work whenever I want. We can't do that. But we can at least give them some control in yeah. being able to have a life and, and manage work around. So that would be, stuff. that sounds like one of the biggest things because if you're feeling obligated to turn up for work and, and you, yeah, it's something you yeah, yeah. Yeah. Even if you're great at it and love it, it still can become a grind. So you need that flexibility to hit the surf or whatever. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. Too. And when we can, uh, you know, again, it's very hard to say, oh, let's all stop at two o'clock today and, and do something because the beer doesn't stop or the bottling line doesn't stop. You don't yeah. want to be stopping it and then starting again and then everyone's home later because it's still got to get finished before yeah. we go. So uh, we really have to plan when we want to try and create space to do things. Mm -hmm. We do close down for two days every year and take everybody away on what we call field day, even though it's two days. But <laughs> that was the last one. Uh, this year we went to O'Reilly's, which is you know, ironic because they're under threat at the moment from the bushfires, so we're right. hoping that they survive. But um, we've done North Stratty, we've done Coran Cove, we've done, we try to go somewhere local. Yeah. We've done Hinterland ones. Uh, and yeah, two days of just getting everyone out of the work environment we do um, various activities, not sitting in a conference room looking at a screen, but various it's activities that are sometimes <laughs> that help, um, you know, get different parts of the team hanging out with people who they don't normally get to hang yeah, out with every day. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's, a that's really one of the important. things we do. We celebrate anniversaries. So on the 12 month anniversary that um, people have been uh, here with us, I mean, that's not, I say we, we celebrate the end. It's not kind of like, oh, congratulations, you survived a year. It's kind of like a wedding anniversary. It's, hey, we've had a year together. This is awesome. And so. so instead of giving them a medal for, for the past. <laughs> exactly. It's, kind of like, you know, yeah, it's a total celebration. And we, we have a local shaper who shapes them a surfboard. Not That's everybody A lot of people surf, yeah, not everyone does. So some of them have it as a beautiful art piece on their wall, has a message from Brennan and myself on the back. 
And it's, there's the sprinkling of surfboards well, around wonderful. the country, and we're pretty proud no matter where they you go. You should be proud of that. This is a sound, may sound a little bit abstract to some people, but the idea that we have, we've evolved from, uh, from nomads and tribes and villages and stuff like that. So we are trying to pr uh, create tribes around us. Yeah, absolutely. So in a way, this is a modern surrogate for a tribe. And yeah. if you're successful at it, people feel really at home and they give back so much where they're loyal, they're productive. Uh, and they look after you in this in this time when you're down. So by giving them this rite of passage and, and an artifact to take away as a symbol for that, it's a very powerful for thing. For sure. And I want them, you know, back to that thing of getting home from work and going, Ugh. I want them to go home yes. with a yeah, with a bit of I don't know, still some spark in their eye. Not like we've drained it all out. Amazing. Way, so. Yeah. So that's no small thing. You talk about the small things that you do to create a team. I don't think that's small at all. I think that's you going, how was the intention? How can I create a team? And then you've just come up with the, the ways to do it and seen that it's working. That's not small at all. I think that's pretty profound. So well it done. It is pretty cool. I guess it, it, we, it got put to the test. Yeah. When, um, so our first building was a few hundred meters that way. Yeah. And uh, it was a hard grind for the first 10 years when, when there was no craft beer market on the Gold Coast and mm. so on. So I don't want to make it sound like it was just boom, yeah. grown out of this place. It wasn't like that. But it did get to a point where we were we'd taken over some little units next to us. And yeah, totally the same. Really totally jammed just, you <laughs> saying, punching holes through the next exactly. one. Exactly. Yeah, yes, his management of the warehouse skills came into their own in that environment. But um, you would have got lost in it. Yeah, it was a bit like that. We'd go in and go, "Who's in here? Who's in here?" And every time we took over another little unit, got another toilet and another front door, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit messy. Oh, it now you've streamlined uh, the hem of the Exactly. And this, this was designed specifically, you know, his paper on our dining room table with little circles cut out to move tanks around and awesome. go, exactly how do we want this and how do we want to feel? Yeah. What do we want to feel like when people are having to run from one place to the other? What, you know, is there anything in their way? Blah, blah, blah. And right from the get go, when you come into the, the automatic gate, it opens up into the, the big garden effectively. Uh, it's, it's very welcome. And as I was saying, the door actually opened up for us when we came. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, is that an automatic door? Just having a little gust of wind came open. But when, so when we were down here, we were really kind of jammed up against it. We, we, we couldn't, if, you know, if a piece of equipment was down for a moment, it was stressful because it was, oh, we're not going to be able to make enough beer because we're really pushing capacity. And Brennan and I, on one of our field days, actually at Karang Cove, we got our team together and we said, here's our choice. We can kind of try and put a lid on this, and and um, this is what Burley Broom will be, and that the kind of the opportunities will only be what exists now. And you know, if, if you're all happy with that, we'll do that. Or we can start again. Did you say we're uh, if we're all happy with it? As in our team. So you you to the team. Yeah. yeah. Uh, or we can move and start again. Uh, but this time, if we do that, Brennan and I are doing it on our own. We'll do it if you guys want to do right. it. It'll be hell. There'll be, you know, construction is horrible, moving is horrible, moving equipment, mm. new systems to learn, everything else. You'll go from walking in each day to work, knowing what exactly what you're going to do where you're going to go, to for a while being, yeah. well, and they all said, let's do it. Wow. So here we are. What an yeah. incredible thing in itself just to open up to the team because, again, you can't I was do, do it, it on my own. <laughs> That's a mistake, right? It's awesome. So what are some of the skill sets that you learned? So I'm just trying to fill in the blanks here from this incredible story where you started in corporate law, met your husband in Hawaii and, um, and came up with this vision together. What are some of the, because you didn't, you weren't CEO of a company nope. before. No, I wasn't there my you head. <laughs> yeah, you were in your head. So actually started there. Is that where yeah. it started? You're going, I, I, I am going to create something unique. Um, but you knew that was probably going to be a company, so you knew that that involves being a CEO. So you had an idea of, of who you wanted to become in that professional capacity. Yeah, I think I had an idea of the practicalities in terms of um, you know, compliance and um, business structures and right. employment law from, and you know, those types of things. Yeah, and I, I think I, knowing where I wanted to go, I think I made, it a, made a point of making sure they were the types of things I was learning. Yep. Um, but you smile like that. <laughs> yeah. I the soft really. skills, though, I think until you, you're in there, yeah. you can practice and you can read and you can, you know, watch YouTube, although it didn't exist then, but, you know, all <laughs> the, <laughs> as much as you want. But I think until you're in there having a hard conversation or... And your money's on the line and your reputation's on the line. Totally, all of that. As a manager or as a, as a yeah. leader. Yeah. Yeah. So what's... I, I've, look, I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to a lot of great people and I've had a lot of... Um, guidance. Yeah. And I'll, I, I'm like a sponge. Mm. I, I don't necessarily, you know, a lot of people 
qualified or not, are very happy to say, you should do this and you should do that. Yeah. And I don't necessarily just do it, but I definitely listen to it all and then yeah. have to decide what to what to run with. That's yeah. pretty wise. I mean, it, it, everyone gives opinions. They're like yeah. the proverbial. Especially about beer. Oh, I thought it'd be a great name for a beer. You should do this. Yeah. Right. <laughs> have you ever thought about a topic one? Did you have to, you might have had to give them all this. Yeah, I think all the ones we've come up with, they've met up to me. That's pretty amazing. We've got a couple here. We've got... Uh, Mid time is obviously a local reference. I would thought it is. It's the, the best. Um, the best way to surf the the point of early is mid time. Yeah. <laughs> and some of the other ones you've got uh, Fig Jam. You've got uh, twenty eight. What's twenty eight reference? So twenty eight parallel is celebrates the twenty eight day swell in the nineteen seventies when twenty eight days straight it was perfect surf at early point. It's well. never been. So never been like since. And before we know, we had heard the legend. Guys, we're not putting on a beer bottle unless it's true. So what, what year was this? Research. The swell. In the mid seventies. So they're still talking about it. Yes, and we, yeah, we had heard the legends, but then we worked with Pacific Longwater Magazine to make sure, and and um, they did such a great job of going back to a number of the surfers who were around then and pulling together the stories of what it was like, and we ended up on this amazing email chain wow. of everybody remembering so and 60, how they were wagging work and you know they were doing awesome. eight year olds, some of them. Um, and 70s, there might be 10, 20. 70, yeah, yeah. So they'd be in their shorts if people wanted to talk. No, they really the legends, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the one, uh, Twisted Farm, the one yes. we're really hear about, of course, is uh, my wife's oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so the first, we actually had uh, with partners a little brewery in Hawaii. That was our first oh, yes. practice, yeah. practice yeah. <laughs> at this. Uh, and That's your first, we were talking about. Um, European breweries about how some of them don't count first three hundred years. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> that's our first years, yeah. Um, but the first, when, when our children were born, the, first, the next beer that Brennan brewed after they were born, we named after them. And it was a little bit easier there because it was, it was a brew pub. We didn't bottle the beer, so we didn't have to come with a label and everything right. else. You could just write a name on, a, on the bar and yeah. everything would be named. Yeah. And that, so they were named after the kids. And I just kind of used to joking around with them. So I had the kids, where's mine? Yeah, <laughs> one day I was hanging out in the washing and I just had this, I know what I want my beer to be. So I said, like, yeah, I said, I've got it. But I said, that was when we were still in Hawaii. So I think you're going to have to wait till we get back to Australia and build our brewery because to get it, it might be lost on the Americans. I think we need that joke in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so does it sell well? <laughs> it does, it does. Although look, like all our, we, we've, we've had, since we started, we've had a number of brands that we've brought along for a while and then we've, Given them a little bit of a holiday. One of our very best, our, our German wheat beer, Hef, uh, won a gold medal at the World Beer Cup. It's an amazing beer. But as the market kind of evolves and shifts, mm. I think there's one constant in beer in Australia at the moment, and that's that nothing is constant. It is so dynamic. It's, it's, for a it's while. growing. Yeah. My neighbour on one side and two doors up has brewery in, you know, does, does their own brewery. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Incredible. yeah. Um, so, my wife's will probably go on a little bit of a holiday soon because we want to make room for some new exciting stuff, but it'll come back. Give her a rest. <laughs> she is brewed with love. <laughs> nice. I think it's a master stroke. <laughs> so, back on to um, things like skill sets and mindset, uh, or the things that make a difference. So, you've had to learn skill sets along the way, uh, which you've been adept at understanding that it started early in your studying corporate law, you're going, okay, how can I, what can I study here that's going to get me this vision? Because you knew where you wanted to go yep. and you wanted to run your own company. Um, what about mindset? Um, we were talking to someone the other day and they said, um, no, actually, my partner Michelle is behind the camera right now. It was you who we were talking to. Oh, I'm going to say. <laughs> you were quoting, we were, she was quoting you and she said, Brennan lost his job and the brewery mm -hmm. sold at the same time. This is the one in, in Hawaii. And you... You came in and you said, that's awesome. Yes. Where did that come from? I don't know, but I'm glad it did. So, yeah, he came home literally one day and said that the brewery had filed for bankruptcy. Uh, this was when he was an employee mm -hmm. in it. And I, something, I guess I had spent back in, you know, not even kind of in my immediate consciousness, but everywhere else, it was just such a big thing that I wanted to, when an opportunity came, I was ready to jump. Yeah, that and was your attitude. It's like, I'm, yeah, I'm waiting I'm, for it. Opportunity spotting. <laughs> and I didn't really know what it was going to look like. And sometimes, yeah. often, opportunities come dressed up as not opportunities. Problems. Yeah. yeah. And he did. He came home and said, oh, the brewery's filed for bankruptcy. I had, I guess, absorbed a little bit of, of stuff while being in America that... Um, the can do this. Well, that some businesses that file for this Chapter 11 thing oh, they okay. talk about, and I don't know if it's changed, then end up getting sold for... Really cheap. Mm. 
I, I didn't have a clue really how that process worked or whatever, but that was, I think, you went, you <laughs> maybe there's oh, a chance, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we put together this little group of people and bought Amazing. it for not much money. And, yeah. yeah, but it came from you having the right, being able to recognize the opportunity from having the right mindset. Did that mindset, so you've seen that you, you don't know where that came from, but it came from um, somewhere we are products to some degree about what we've been exposed to. Absolutely. Did, yeah. did, did your parents and or mentors, was there someone that you go, that had a real uh, similar kind of attitude? Yeah, definitely I was brought up in a home that was um, about, I guess, positive mindset. Really. Which in itself is pretty rare because most people sure. uh, are under the pump and they're, they're yeah. in survival mode to some degree. Uh, the um, nervous system is, and they're like, I've just got to get bills paid. That's survival mode. For sure. I, I, I do remember different. some recollections at school where being in kind of conversations where I might have been somewhere with school friends and parents and whatever, and other parents kind of saying, oh, you know, little Johnny, he could, he could never do this, or kind of talking them down. Right. And I remember thinking, oh, that seems parents would never say that. Yeah, about me. Yeah. You know? Not that they were, you're amazing, you're all but just definitely the attitude of, you want to do it, go chase it. Yeah. You have to work, Which is go a, do it. Which is a central uh, tenement in anything, really, isn't it? If you, if you, it used to be, it's up to me, some yeah. version of that, I'm the master of my own destiny. If Absolutely. you come to that, then that's a good start. Yeah. Really good start. Yeah. Back on the mindset again, or further into mindset, uh, the yeah. idea of, of you had a vision and you partnered with the right person to uh, help help create that, and you could gather the team around you and you increased your skill set. Uh, you're still going to come across challenges. There's still going to be the dark night of the soul, so to speak. There's still going to be the hero's challenge before she triumphs or they triumph. Um, I, I did hear a story where you were in a, a liquor store working hand to hand promoting your, your brew. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Because that sounds like that was definitely like yeah. a point where you questioned it. Oh, look, we, yes, I, I would say we never questioned, um, never questioned should we have done this? Never. It just wasn't. It was in. more, okay, now what do we do? But right. It was never, did we do the right thing? Yeah. Uh, I don't even, we just, our heads never went there. Um, but yeah, when we opened, we, we'd come from this really vibrant craft brewing scene in America. We had a business in it. We, you know, lived it for a number of years. And that was in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. And Brennan had brewed in um, Boston and Japan and a number of other places. But, um, and we were, you know, so clear on, on what we wanted to come and do. We were so passionate about it. We could see it, we could taste it. Kind of built it. We're thinking we were here to save the Gold Coast. They have no craft beer. They need us. We have a responsibility. <laughs> we can do this. We, there was an element of that. But you yeah. have. But yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> I opened the doors waiting for the stampede, and nobody was bloody there. Right. You know, that's and it was. It, that's what it felt like. Man, this isn't going to just happen. Mm. You know. Um, so literally, we did, we did. We got a mantra: of one, one taste bud at a time. One taste bud at a time. Right. Because we, what we realised very quickly was we had to build trust. That um, people here were used to only a handful of beer um, brands, which, which were the big ones. No, big ones, or, or imports were a bit of a thing. Yeah. Um, but if they didn't know it, they weren't going to try it. I mean, the world now is so different. It's kind of very different. I don't want the same one I've had. Before. Yeah, the one more variation. Totally different. That was not the world when we started. Mm. And if they didn't recognise it or know it, then just you know, why should I trust that? Yeah. Now, because people didn't get beer, how it's made, what, where it comes from, don't know. Even comments like, oh, but it's just made from down, down, from down the road. How good can it be? Yeah. It's kind of like beer is better. And than fresh, but that, that took a while to learn. <laughs> maybe people were drinking more for the the effect it's having. That was more of a culture maybe, thing. And then maybe. eventually, taste buds, like you said, you change taste buds at one at a time. But in itself, that is creating a market. That's attuning the market to. Uh, appreciating a finer product. Yeah, yeah, there was already an import market there, but you've helped to perhaps put a finer point on that. Yeah, and I think too when people, you know, there's a number of things coming together. We've seen it happen in coffee and wine and everything else, and people started getting more interested in, well, where is my food? Yeah. Where does it come from? Yeah. What's in it? Uh, people were traveling and, and going to places like America and Europe and getting it, developing a palette for different beers, yeah. coming home and going well, back to this stuff, or, or you know, whatever, what other choices? They don't have a choice anymore. Yeah. So there are a whole bunch of things, but but yes, to, to drive a little bit of momentum at the start, literally Brendan and I were in bottle shops pretty much every Friday night with our little sample pile, he'd be in one, I'd be in another. And believe it or not, in Queensland, it was hard to give away free beer. That's <laughs> how, like, <laughs> we kind of want to all time with these people. <laughs> and I'd call him and kind of see how many of you managed to, to, and not only would they not try it, some would be downright 
rude. They'd be offended that you're. They just, that you know, doing like, something different. Oh, that shit. Or, or the, our first beers were called Duke. They'd say, is that Duke or Puke? Oh. I haven't even tried it. And it's true, you know, it's your way. And I would tell all that stuff just to not take it personally mm. and to, to kind of go. Well, especially when you're, you're fronting up and, and you're in the custom, you know, you're in the marketplace. Yeah, absolutely. It's, so, but I think, like I said, we never questioned have we done the right thing. We never questioned, oh, maybe this is going to be too hard. We just, we couldn't let us, A, we couldn't let ourselves go there because we've both given up jobs. We had two kids and had a mortgage. So <laughs> we didn't have to work. We the <laughs> We jumped with no net. <laughs> so, uh, but it, it was, I guess, just perseverance. I think the other part of it is when, you know, when you, certainly for me, it was a very personal passion, um, albeit, there was a lot of, you know, and other people and, and a team and a culture to make it feel the way I wanted it to feel. But what drives you in those early days when you're writing your business plan and, um, you know, you're out there, you don't mind if you're working 24-7, da-da-da. And you don't mind rejection. No, it's just it's a personal thing. We started to employ people and very quickly what was driving me every day was no longer this personal drive. It was... I felt I carried a responsibility now. These the people put their faith right. in me yeah. to come and work for me. They put their family's livelihood in my that hands. That's big, isn't it? Because you knew and what that was. And then again, I had no, I couldn't question. I just had to find a way. And that, yeah. and I think the little things like that along the way, that you know, the, the reason, your, your big vision and your purpose and your passion, that, that kind of is all there, I suppose. But but the the, the motivators and the, the the key things that are driving the drive mm. at various points in time do evolve. Yeah, but it does say a lot about you and about any individual that does it that way, that, have, that feels that responsibility. You've got people like Christopher Scase or whatever that build an empire, but they don't necessarily have the same accountability and they let it collapse and everyone right. falls in a heap because of it. But you have built it solidly all the way along and it's key to get any foundation solid in any structure. Well, it has driven, I guess, too, how we've grown because we've, we've purposely stayed away, I've called them, should be hits of growth. We don't want... You know, we've had opportunities. So I send a pallet to this country, a, a container to this country, that country, the other country, and we've said no. And, and it doesn't feel very cutthroat, entrepreneurial, mm. of me to say no. But what's the reason behind that? You because want to... I don't want us to have to ramp up production, maybe put on a few extra people, and then yeah, put the box. The and then, yeah. yeah, and and uh, you know, it's a, it's a you can see from the facility, it's it's you need a lot of tanks, and you need you know all kinds, of, and to to ramp up. Production in that way, yep. the brewing is, I think, very risky for us, the business of our scale. Yep. And I just wanted it to be sustainable growth that we could, we knew we could continue to build on, more mm. well, like building blocks than just take the hit when you can get it. Yeah, so, that's very well. <laughs> Where would you like this to go? Uh, do you have a, a, an even broad, more broadening vision of this? What's what's your next what's, what's your next hill that you want to climb? You go, oh wow, that's the top of this one. So, uh, but how we now kind of frame up in terms what we're doing is brewing the beers of your life and that that relates to the actual beers we, we want to brew beers that are not um, so crazy that they're um, just a novelty and they're around for a bit of a short time mm. and we, we try and brew styles in our core range that truly can be enjoyed every day or how often you want to have a beer and sit down and have a few beers and so in the product sense that's what we're doing but it also refers to um, the ride, I think, of our lives as a team, yeah. and uh, we the, the whole decision to move and and what that offered to our team was the, to be able to create more opportunities for them, and we just want to keep building on that. We're not here to take over the world. We're not here to you know it's not in our five year plan to say we want five more of these. Mm. It's it's more about being able to grow in a way that that keeps what we have and doesn't put the culture or the, the dynamic or the business itself at risk, but just continue. I just got a little goosebumps there because <laughs> we were talking a bit before about culture and, and how valuable it is. I'm going to send you that book that's, um, that's had a big impact on me, which is Zappos, Delivering Happiness, the okay. online yeah, yeah. Um, footwear company. Incredible, incredible that I've never heard of it than before the book. Our, our business coach um, told me about it, but their hot um, ticket, their most valuable uh, commodity is their culture. It's not even the people as such that's high, yeah. but their culture. So that anyone that's set in their culture and feel like they're in this tribe yeah. uh, or this community that really values them and, and, and gets the best out of them. So you're creating that, maybe, maybe you kind of are taking over the world. 
Yeah. Well, hopefully we're changing reasons, yeah. the world for, for some people, for our people. Yeah. You know, if, if, because they're, they come here to work, but the fact that they come here to work has an impact then on their family. Yeah. And yeah, that that is, we don't want just the bit of work. Yeah. yeah, I I don't think this will be the last interview you have, so hopefully you'll uh, <laughs> have okay with that. Because you each time you tell your story, it sits out a ripple, and people go, oh, "Wow, it's that maybe safe to do it that way, maybe safe to to show more, uh, have more care of my employees, and treat them like a team." And, and that ripple effect can literally change the world. For sure, yeah, that's pretty amazing. So, what what do you think your best advice would be to your first? incarnation of yourself, like early self, when you first started would be, well actually to, to the person that was in the, the liquor store feeling a little bit like, wow, how do we make this happen? What would be your best advice to that person now? Wow. <laughs> you, you persevered, you didn't quit. That, well, so. that's, I guess that's really the advice. I, I guess if you, um, um, I suppose, you know, perseverance definitely has to be there, but probably perseverance alone isn't enough because you don't want to keep beating your head against the wall yeah, for something all. that's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, for me, and maybe everyone's everyone's different, but I think um, knowing why we we're doing it and and kind of staying true to that and not being able to not not going oh well, we're up against this challenge. Maybe doing things, um, or maybe what was important to us. Maybe we can let that go and take a shortcut or a perceived shortcut this way, or maybe we can. We, we had to just, I think, believe in, in um, what, what we really were here for and why we wanted to do it and how we wanted to do it mm. and be true to that and find a way that still protected that yeah. to, to, to do things and, and not, um, you know, you do have to be flexible, of course, but still do everything against the backdrop of what was important and not lose that. Mm. I think that was... That's important for us. But, yeah, so it sounds like you, you did that as, as the person that, that was the early part of the story to, to now, you did that. So maybe you, you don't necessarily have uh, advice to that younger self. Was there an easy, would there be a, a oh, way that you could have done I'd probably easy? say relax, relax a bit. It was, breathe. It, I do, yeah, breathe. <laughs> don't feel like you have to do it all by yeah. tomorrow. And it's going to be okay. Yeah, yeah. I think some of the things that were on my to-do list when we opened the doors are still on my to-do list. Yeah, so you <laughs> trick, I have several. <laughs> the just, yeah, don't ever think you're going to empty the inbox or finish the yeah. so it's you part have to, of the job. You have to find a way to be okay yeah. and relax now, don't you? Because yeah. that to-do list is just... So if we could just get back to that little point where you're talking about the, the dark night of the soul, the point where you're you're a little bit um, challenged in that liquor store where you're like, wow, is there even a market for this? And there wasn't, and you helped create that. Some people say that this brewery, your vision, uh, primed the market for that particular... Uh, trend that, ha that has happened and it's become not a trend but a passion in the whole industry so sure. from that point where you've gone up we're just going to persevere you mentioned you were you just employed people um there's obviously a bit that happened there what, what happened after that point where you're going, we're just going to keep going yeah i look i guess that um you know we, did, we started to get a few orders um the treetops tavern was our first customer for a pallet of beer like, and they're still a customer oh wow that's great uh which is amazing and and so i look i i guess looking back it's really hard to remember the details back then i think i intentionally don't dwell on i don't let myself remember yeah the bad bits. that's part of your strategy <laughs> that's, that's so what people want to hear how do you do it and you didn't yeah, dwell on it no and but i you know obviously we started to get some orders i i do remember in those early days kind of saying to everyone i wish i could just Half a person. <laughs> it felt like I needed a bit of help. That's but funny. putting on a whole person it felt like I couldn't afford it. But I, I, that was also part of it. Was you know, it, taking that first leap just to start the thing was just the first leap. There's been leaps yeah. all along the way. Yeah. And one of the leaps was if if we really want to be able to reach more people, clearly we can only do so much. The two of us being in bottle shops yeah. on a Friday night. Our kids were five and six or whatever they were at the time, younger. Um, we could only do so much, so we, we needed to to bring people on if we were going to be a chance. So it was, it was another little mm. leap to go, we can afford half a person, <laughs> we're just going to have to put a whole person. But then of course, you find out that people are amazing and you start to put good people on and they help you do things way faster than what you put on your own. Yeah. Or, or, um, 
it's scary as hell. <laughs> All along that path. For the obligation and for the, the money that you spend Absolutely, well. yeah. But also, I think we had conversations with ourselves to say, well, if we're not willing to do it, why are we even doing it? Mm. You know? You know what, I'm hearing uh, echoes, again, of your attitude of, of looking for opportunities that, like, I'm, I'm, I have a vision, there are going to be ways where this is going to come up, I'm looking for them, I'm looking for them, so you're taking that leap up every time. Absolutely. Like, I'm, I'm going to have to employ half a person. <laughs> like, I've never even thought that's what I'm cracking up. I have uh, had a couple of businesses that obviously, and I'm sitting there thinking, I can't afford or don't want to risk yeah. having a person. Yeah. I could have just gone, <laughs> <laughs> oh, cool. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, but I've seen that you, you're looking for opportunities all the time to, to leapfrog, to, to go, well, this is how I'm, I want to get up here, and I'm going to have to leapfrog, so let me look for the steps. So I'm seeing that that's been part of your strategy. Absolutely, and you know, trying to mitigate risk as much as possible along mm. the way. Um, but but definitely, it was, it's just a gradual, you know, we've, we've gone from two people now to, uh, I think we're at headcount of about 50. 50 and a half. <laughs> 50 and a half, probably. <laughs> Uh, and that's just the, you know, a kind of a steady, yeah. along, aligned with our steady growth. But but we've always had to employ ahead of the curve. Right. Because, and we haven't always got it right. We sometimes have gone, ooh, we should have had another brewer three months ago. But, um, or was there, wow, that person's not quite a fit. Obviously that would be Oh, some. absolutely. And that's probably some of the soft skills from the early days. Um, and not, you know, not, not their fault. Not largely our fault, choosing the wrong people or, or not, not doing the right things by them to have them um, really be able to excel to their potential mm -hmm. with us. I think, we, yeah, I've definitely had some, some fails in that regard. They were here for the beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think um, now, I, I don't know, it's, it, the, the whole team helps with that too because now we're looking at someone coming on I imagine, obviously, I wanted to really? talk about the hiring? Do, we, we hired another person last <laughs> week. <laughs> Tick off the jobs that we need them to do, obviously, in the skills, but then there's a big process of imagining them in our team. Yeah. Do they add to the team? Yeah. Do they put anywhere at risk? Do they? And, and that's not kind of to say anyone's good, bad, or otherwise. It's just, are they fit? It's and the not work, because it works towards your yeah. vision and, and, and your existing team. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Uh, so in terms of engaging, uh, so you've worked on the team, you've worked on your culture, you've got your vision humming, it's up and running, it's like a, a garden in blue, uh, and it's it's clearly engaged with your audience, uh, the customers, the people that are drinking and ordering your beer. How do you, I, I think on your website you talk about um, your ethos, which is balance and, and character and soul, and, and soul I saw that it was about uh, you know, serving the community and offering and supporting and sharing your product with the local community. Yep. So, uh, do you do you find that you how often do you, do you get down there and have a beer with the? Or, or oh, quite regularly down yeah. here, yeah. But but it, back in the early days, again, we kind of realised, you know, the one taste out of the time thing. We also, I mean, we knew anyway, but I think it became into really stark reality that if we're, you know, we're here thinking we're doing a great thing for the Gold Coast. It's like bringing in a footy team. So we're here. We've got something you can rally around. Yeah. And that's kind of what breweries are in Germany. Around a, a village or whatever, yeah. it's part of it. Yeah. Um, but I think we realised quickly that if we wanted the community to um, engage with us and support us, if you like, we, and we'd have to do it first. And what ways do you? Things. So, well, our, our so? first process that we're coming to, no marketing budget. That actually is some advice for back then. Having marketing, marketing budget. Marketing budget would be good. But <laughs> um, uh, what we came up with was to open the brewery once a month on a Friday night. Because the other Friday nights we were in bottle shops doing tastings. So once a month on a Friday night, I would get behind the beer taps. I'd never bought a beer before we opened the brewery. <laughs> but um, I'd get behind the beer taps. Brennan would um, cook sausages on the barbecue. We'd have someone there strumming on the guitar and we'd invite the community in. Yeah. And all the money from that, not just the profit, all the money, would go to some local group or right. not necessarily a charity a sporting because, group or yeah it's like a local group. community thing that was also bringing joy to, joy to the community which yeah. trying to leverage yeah. the dollars a bit and super a bit like giving away free beer i would in those days i'd spend a few days every month calling woody clubs school groups whatever saying would you like some money free money you don't have to don't have to rock up at money to cook the sausages we'll cook them for you we'll buy them for you we'll, we'll do everything 
you just tell everyone in your club that this is going down and get them to tell a few people because the more people you bring, the money you get. Yeah. Yeah, sounds dodgy. Click. Really? <gasps> <gasps> I bet that's <they're> true. <laughs> Is Within a few years, we've given away a hundred grand doing that, oh, and that kind of it felt so good, and it was more. It, that it was, was our marketing. Amazing. That was our marketing, and yeah. it was one taste bud, one person mm. at a time. And I would like to think that that money had been in the way that we gave it away to small groups that need. You know, if someone could buy some cricket bats for yeah. a, whatever. Um, Fix the fence. Exactly. I'd like to think like it's brought a lot of joy. Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, that's incredible. We didn't cure breast cancer, but we hopefully helped the community. Well, I could say there are some cures for that. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, yeah, they're not. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, any good cause, including breast cancer uh, research is a good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, those ripples that you create when you do that, whether it's in your team, in your in your marriage, in your partnership with everyone that you're in partnership here with in, team, in your team, uh, including the community, they just have such, they can have such a wide ranging effect. I think that's right. Yeah, and they can just, because obviously that ripple hits that person, that person may be influenced to then create their own uh, ripple as well. And it that's just goes really, on. So it's yeah. really incredible. So again, in terms of engaging with your customer base, you, uh, the types have changed, obviously. A lot of people do reviews. Some people do reviews in the moment while they're in your venue without actually engaging with you. They've got a problem. Uh, it might be positive as well. They might have a problem and they may not engage with you. They go straight online and sort of doing a negative review. Mm. Do you have someone managing your reviews here? So we have, I mean, obviously we've only got a small-ish team. Um, so we do have a digital person who um, digital marketing. monitors yeah, monitors that. Uh, but having said that, if there's ever anything uh, negative, I get involved. Right. So how does that work that person? The, immediately refers to you? Essentially, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I suppose it's a multi-layer thing. One of our marketing managers' KPIs is about number of five-star reviews in the tap house. Wow, okay. So the, the motivation behind that is if the team is doing everything right in the tap house, five-star reviews should happen. Yeah. If they don't, we're not doing something right, particularly if they're not happening regularly. You know, we all know the review world can really be a little bit fake and sometimes comments go up negative particularly negative that maybe aren't genuine yeah. or whatever. So you know, that may generate by someone else has an agenda. Yeah. Uh, we are fortunate to date, I think, that, that if people do have um, a genuine issue, uh, the, the most common way of communicating that to us seems to be by private message, still often not in person. But by private message? That, that alone probably tells you that you are doing a lot of things right. They, they want to give you the chance. They're still afraid of confrontation or, yeah, yeah, or being yeah. too uh, honest, perhaps, but they're at least dealing with you directly instead of being uh, hidden. Maybe. And that's what it feels. I love your beer. I'll keep buying it, but I just want you to know. Awesome. <laughs> Fantastic. I, I take that as a positive too. I really yeah. do. And uh, I would love to be able to say hand on heart that I've been involved in every single negative there are probably some that have slipped through the cracks and I hate that, but but if certainly um, issues come up, I'm involved, often it's me calling the person or contacting them one way or another, often calling if I can, just because I think that's a chance. Someone's engaged with our product, obviously a lot has gone into that product being in that person's head. So yep. don't take that for granted. The yeah, whole process has been huge. It. So if they've had an experience that's not good, the last thing I want them to go away thinking is just, I don't care. Yeah. I care. <laughs> Big time. So, so you're um, out of the company actually cares. <laughs> well, because about me drinking. What's going beer. into it, you know? Yeah. But you don't want to do all of that and then it not count for anything. Yeah. So I see it as an opportunity to turn into a positive. Again, with that that um, core mindset, I think that you. Someone's have. contacted us. Let's talk to them. Yeah. You know. Uh, but but in terms of staying on top of it and um, you know not not missing something online and so on, it's, it's scary because. You, you, don't know if you are covering everything all the time. Yeah. Uh, you know, we think we do okay. I like it. It's a, like that some business could be driving along the freeway and there's a, there's a billboard and going, what the hell? That's my that's a billboard saying don't buy from my exactly. company. That, that may be a review on a, on a platform that didn't even know existed. Exactly. So you've got to be all over this. And it, it's, it sounds like you are. You have some, some of them are public. Some of them are private. Yep. The, the groups and the you know whatever forums and, and forums. Yeah. There are all kinds of. Craft beer review. Oh, yeah. I think it gets <laughs> a little bit uh, tricky there. Uh, but, you know, genuinely, people can have a bad experience with you. It might not be anything, but might, might be 
that the beer was sitting in the sun on the driveway in the bottle shop for two yeah. days before they put it in the fridge. Who knows? But if it's our label, came from us, we're going to deal with it. Yeah. So um, that attitude that you that you would have been involved, um, and you and again, you probably don't have that many negative reviews because you're doing so many great things, right? But, so. but shit happens. Yeah. You know, someone will get a box with a bottle missing. You want to pay six so bucks for a cart of beer and have a bottle missing. That, that's like saying. Yeah, that's where the whole phrase is. It's a year Right? I'm okay. <laughs> no one wants that. Or, the, or it can be that a cap hasn't quite gone on properly yeah. and it's leaked. Yeah. And it might have leaked all over their car. Mm -hmm. We have been known to pay for car clean. Don't everybody call me car clean. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you, if you pick up the phone and talk to them, you pretty quickly figure out. Yeah. Are they for real? So, in terms of uh, being able to contact them via phone, how has that always been possible? Uh, usually the first, so the team knows anyone who's, who's um, either on the end of the emails that come in from external inquiries, oh, the website, the message message stuff, yeah, all that type of stuff, uh, first response back is, you know, where'd you buy the beer, what's the date code mm -hmm. on the beer, get as much info as you can, which I don't Yeah. and we take it from there. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, at Aura, uh, our best practice involves a lot of those steps, so you're already in rarefied error, we thought <laughs> that people were actually A, paying attention to reviews, but B, taking a proactive and really constructive approach from the top, mind you, um, with an opportunity, taking this opportunity to improve. That's pretty rare. Well, and also, I don't, I mean, you know, there's some of those hard conversations. I don't feel like I should be putting, because we've, you know, we've employed someone to be a digital media person, I don't feel like it should be their job to go and deal with the confrontation. Yeah, so that is, that's what they're employed for. That is a very, really. can be a very pointy end of, it, of uh, conversations. Absolutely, and it has skill. a big impact on the business. Yeah. So, so yeah. makes sense to be involved. So maybe if you're looking for someone to do that, maybe uh, hostage negotiate, <laughs> ex, ex FBI, hostage negotiate. That's the skill set you want. That sounds like you've got that. I'm learning. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So we love what you're doing here. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I love hearing your story. Oh, thank I can't you. wait to try some of the beers. In fact, I've got a couple here. How about we crack out some <laughs> Which one do you like? Well, I like both of them, so you choose. Oh, oh, you go for this one. I'll go for the blonde. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. She is. Tasty work, isn't it? <laughs> the Bragg Effect is brought to you by Bragg Reviews, the review management software that helps businesses improve their reputations one review at a time. Check it out at braggreviews.com.